this week's parsha is parsha's Taldais, and uh, I want to share with you an idea. I see the Maral discusses in the Gurarya, but it's an idea that I heard from uh, my Rosh Hashiva. I think it has uh, it's a beautiful shot in the uh, in the Psukim, but I think it give, can also give us an insight. To me that's uh, very important as to uh, what we should strive for in a marriage. How do we define a successful marriage? What are we trying to accomplish? And I think that uh, the next step is, and once we've got that clear, I think perhaps we'll have more success in terms of what we're trying to define and be uh, as, as goals for our children as well. We have at the end of this week's parsha, after the brachas, Yaakov comes in, takes the subterfuge, is able to get the brachas away from uh, Esav, and uh, Yitzchak and Rivka send Yaakov away. They say. Uh, Vayikra Yitzchak al Yaakov, Yitzchak calls Yaakov, Vayavarech also, and he blesses him, Vayetzavehu, and he uh, instructs him, gives him the following charge. It says, Vayomer lo, lo sikach isha mibnoz kanan. He says, you need to get married, but I don't want you taking a wife from the children of Canaan that are in our area. Kum lech padena aram beisa besuol avi imecho. Go to padena aram to the house of besuol who is the father of your mother, which means is your maternal grandfather. Vekach lecho misham isha mibnos lavan achi imecho. And find a wife from the daughters of lavan who is your mother's brother. So I want you to go outside of Canaan, where we're living all descendants of Canaan. I don't want a descendant from Canaan. You go to your, uh, you go to your grandfather, to your uncle's home, and there you'll find yourself a wife. They are descendants from shame. They're Semitic. That's where the word Semitic. Anti-Semitic doesn't mean just against Jews. Anti-Arab technically is anti-Semitic too, because anybody that comes from Yishmael is a Semite. Semite comes from the word shame. That's the word in Hebrew. It sounds antishemute. You hear it in Hebrew and English. You don't hear it so much, Semite. But, uh, but that's where it comes from. So I, I want you to get, the lineage should stay within the lineage of shame. I don't want you to marry one of the women of Canaan. And Vayiten Lucho as Birchas Avram, Lucholo Zarecho, Itoch, and there's a special blessing that was given to Avram Avinu that is going to now continue on with you, Yaakov. Right? The land, this land is going to be your land, is going through you. And he sends him away, and he goes to Padanaram, to Lavan, to Sul Arami, to his, uh, the, uh, the brother of, his, of Rivka. Fine. So the Pasuk then says, So Vayar Esav, Kiverach Yitzchak et Yaakov. So Esav sees that Yaakov gets this additional blessing. This is not just the blessing was taken away as the birthright. He's giving him the blessing aside from the birthright. He gave him a special blessing which is called Birchas Avraham. It, it's got to do with the land of Eretz Yisrael. And Esav sees Yaakov gets it. And that in, a, in conjunction with that, he wants him to get a wife, and he sends him away from the Benos Canaan. So, uh, so Vayar Esav Kiroz Benos Canaan Be'ena Yitzchak Aviv. So Esav sees that the doors of Canaan are not what his father Yitzchak is looking for in marriage for his children. So therefore, so Vayelach Esav El Yishmael. So Esau goes to Yishmael. Yishmael is also 
from Avram, from Shem. So he goes to Yishmael. Vayikach es machlas bas Yishmael. And he marries a wife whose name is Machlas, the daughter of Yishmael ben Avram, who was Achas Nevoyos, Al Nashav, in addition to his existing wives, takes him lowly Yishmael, right? She says, in addition, because he uh, should have divorced them. You know, he wants his cake and eat it. You know, he, he adds them to the ones that he defers to. But anyway, he takes her, and what's her name? Her name is Machlas. Machlas Bas Yishmael. The end of Vayishlach. So that's the end here in End of Tolos. It also goes through the history a little bit of Asaph and his descendants. And there it talks about who he married. So it brings down his first two wives from the Benos Canaan, Elon Achiti and Alivama. Achivi, Chittite, and Chivi, those were the first two wives. They were children of uh, daughters from Chit, the Chittites and the, Hi, and the Chivites, who were families of Canaan. And then it brings his third daughter, uh, the third wife, says, as, as Bosmas Bas Yishmol Achos Nevaios. So again, it's the daughter of Yishmol. Seems to be the same. This is his third wife. But here it is not referred to her by the name of. Machlas, it refers to her by the name of Basmas. So Rashi's bothered by this. So Rashi says, Ulahalan, earlier in Perik Chavches, which is in Toldos, Korola Machlas. So Rashi says, So what, what, what's, where was her name? Was her name Machlas? Was it Basmas? Why is it calling her Machlas? And here it's calling her Basmas, two different names. Right? Doesn't say there were any tax issues. So, what, 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 what's the reason they changed the, the, for the name change here? So, Matsasi Ba Goddess Medrash Sefer Shmuel. Rashi brings down, he found in that, in Hagoda, in a, uh, it's a, uh, a uh, Medrash that's uh, focused more on homiletics, on Sefer Shmuel, that. Gimel mochlin lahem avonosehem. There are three categories of people that they get forgiven for their sins. Three categories of people that get forgiven for their sins. Gersh nizgayer, someone who goes through conversion. Ha'ola legdula, someone who ascends to a position of greatness, a position of leadership. Someone is coronated, becomes, takes on a a leadership position, Vahanosa Isha, and somebody marries a woman. And the Medrash says, what's the source for this? It says, it's from here. Lama Khan. we learn it out from here. Lekach Nikres Machalas, that's why her name was called Machalas, her real name was Basmas. Why is she called Machlas? Where does the word Machlas come from? What's the Shorish? Mechila. Mechila. Mechila means forgiveness. Shenim chulu avonosav. Because his sins were forgiven. So the reason it calls her Machlas is because her sins were forgiven. And this is brought, by the way, this has practical impact on us too. Right? Why does the chassan under the chuppah wear a white kittel? Why did the chassan call a fast on the day of a wedding? Because the day they're getting forgiven for their sins. So therefore it's like Yom Kippur. It's like Yom Kippur, you wear white, you fast. And it's like their day of forgiveness. Therefore, that's where that custom comes from. That's why we wear the white. Where is that based on? Here. Esau's third wife, his name is Machlas, her real name is Basmas. When you get married, you get Mechila. It's a very difficult thing to understand. I mean, first of all, we could argue, you know, we've had people get married in the Torah. It's not the first time someone's getting married. Maybe they wanted to show it that even by Esau, even someone like Esau gets married. 
Hashem will give him forgiveness. Right? Maybe, maybe that we could argue. That's why it expresses it specifically over here by Esav, to show even Esav. Maybe that you could argue. And the, the, the morale over here in the Guru Arya, he says as follows. He says that the reason is by, you know, what's, what's the common denominator between all those three? I haven't seen the Medrash inside, but the source the, Mar- uh, the Rashi brings down from the Medrash is ours, is what's here by marriage. So how does it teach you that by the other three, by the other two? Why should the Ola Ligdula be the same thing? Why should Gershon uh, is Geyer? Why should be a convert or somebody who sense of greatness be the same thing? So the Maral says there's a common theme between all of these things. So the Maral says that each one of these three individuals, they're becoming a new Bria. They're becoming a new entity. Right? And since they're becoming a new entity, therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives them forgiveness. He says, marriage, we're two half souls that are coming together as one, that's forming a, be forming a new entity. So it's like a, a different person. It's become a, a complete person. So therefore, new person, slate is, is clean. He says leadership, the Jewish definition of leadership is when you are an individual, you're not a leader, your focus is yourself. Right? When you become a leader, you become a king, the Rambam calls it the lady, you're the heart of the Jewish people. It's like you've now merged, become, you become part of everybody. You're not just focusing on yourself, now you become part of everyone. That's also some type of transformation. And uh, conversion, that the, the Gemara tells us, that a person who converts is like a newborn. Gershon Gayer Kekatan Shenol Adami. In fact, it has halachic implications too. All previous familial relationships are no longer, that's technically no longer your brother, no longer your sister, no longer your father, no longer, you're a newborn person. Right? So I understand exactly what does that mean? What's this transformation? What does it tell us exactly? But a very strong question I heard from my Rosh Hashiva, and we want to address that too, is that which wife of Asaph's is this. It's his third wife. Right? Why are you waiting to give this message? You want to give it by Asaph, give it by Asaph. Why are you waiting to give it by the third wife? Why not give this message by... He talks about his other two wives that he married. You want to tell me marriage gives you mechila? And tell it by the first wife. What is unique by specifically by this third marriage that the Torah is giving us this message? And I think there's tremendous insights that we can gain from it. So we want to understand in general, what does it mean when a person gets married, they get forgiveness, and they become a new person, what does that mean it's, it's, in and of itself? And uh, maybe we get an insight into the other two as well, leadership and, 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 a con- and conversion. And why is Avram Avinu, why is the Torah waiting till Asaph's third wife to give us this message? Because if it's an important message, give it to by the first wife. Right. Just wonder, I don't know if I said at the beginning of class, but uh, Rochel Bas uh, Devora is having surgery right now. It's a student in our school, very serious surgery. So today's share, the learning should be for a for Shlema for her. So I think let's focus on the idea that when a person gets married, he gets mechila because you become like a new person. We find this, by the way, the same concept 
The Rambam in Hilchas Tshuva, Rambam has 20 chapters devoted to person who becomes a Baal Teshuvah, a person who does, uh, who repents. So he says that a person gets full Teshuvah, you become like a new being. You become like a new, a new being. It's like he's like a, a new person. You become like a new person, and like the, the slate is, is wiped clean. So I think that's an insight to begin understanding. So therefore, what does that mean also here? Start with a, another idea, and then maybe we'll work our way back. We give a blessing to the chassan and kala under the chuppah. Right? It's the last of the sheva brachos. Right? We give a blessing. We say that uh, we wish that the chassan and kala should have ava v'achva v'shalom v'reus. Four relationships. We give them. We bless them. Obviously, you're telling somebody, I want you to be this and this and this. I mean, it's, it's ascending. Yeah. So, once we go from Ava, which is love, Achva is brotherhood, Shalom is harmony, and Reus is friendship. So, it would seem that in the hierarchy of relationships, Love is on a lower rung than friendship because you go from you're hoping that their marriage will spiral and grow from Ava to you know you're hoping, you're hoping it's not going to get worse you know less than the things should go downhill you're hoping things should go uphill so you're hoping it goes from love to friendship yes it's yet it's fascinating if you look in the Torah that there's a mitzvah in the Torah that we have Parshas Emor. It says, Vahafta l'reecha kamocha. Right? The most important uh, principle of the Torah, Rabbi Akiva says. What does the Pasuk say? Vahafta, that you shall show love. L'reecha. To who? To your friend. Now, if the Torah is commanding us that we have to show love to our friend, that implies that love is on a higher level than friendship. It means we have a responsibility to try and take the level of friendship and take it to a level of love. So then why did the rabbis formulate a bracha under the chuppah, a bracha at the sheva brachas that goes from ava to reus if the Torah describes the relationship is that ava is greater than reus. That love is greater than friendship, and yet in the blessing it implies friendship is greater than love. So the Rambam Maimonides has a commentary on Pirkei Avos. It's called the Shmona Prokim, eight chapters. It's a very interesting. Uh, and in the Shmona Prokim, he's talking about, there's a, a Mishnah that refers to acquiring friends, having rela- different relationships. And he says, he brings down, he quotes Aristotle. Rama was very familiar with the works of Aristotle, and he quotes him. And he talks about Aristotle's definition of friendship. What does it mean to have a friend? And he gives three levels of friendship. I want to deal with the first and the last one. I'm not, the little one's not needed from now. He says like this, the Rama says that most of us our friendships are, he calls it, a friendship of convenience, but not necessarily in the negative, in a disparaging manner. Like, we don't like to, having experiences on our own. We like shared experiences. Right? You don't go to the Grand Canyon on your own. You don't go with someone. You want, people want to share experiences. And then for most of our friends, our friends that are there that we can have joint experiences, shared experiences. He says, but there's a higher level, Aristotle says, the highest level of friendship, he says, is a friend that you're willing to let down your guard. He says, everybody really has a facade. Nobody really sees who we are. We just see 
We let people see who we want them to think we are, but we don't really let them see who we are. Right? And part of the reason is, is embarrassment, self-defense. You know, people see who we are and what our inadequacies are and what our weaknesses are, we take advantage of it. People look at us different, can hurt us. She says the highest level of friendship is where you feel so comfortable with a person and you know that even when they will critique you, it's only because they care for you and they want to see you grow that you're willing to let down that facade so they should see you for who you really are because they will love you for who you really are and they will help you grow and correct the things that you need correcting. He says that's the very highest level of friendship. And he says people are lucky if you have one or two friends like that in your life. Generally you don't, that's not the kind of friend that most of us have. So most of us, our neighbors, our friends, right, we're starting with friendship. With most, most people that we interact with, friendship, people that we like sharing experiences with. And that's the lowest level of friendship. On that, the Torah tells us that there is a mitzvah, v'ahavt l'recha kamocha. It should ratchet up a notch. It shouldn't just be a lower level. Friend, get it to the next level. What's the next level? Love. So the level of love, concern, compassion. That you want that level of friendship. We should try and have friendships move it towards love. Chassan and Kala that are in front of us, you know, we would hope that love is there. They've already gone to that. They're not just more shared experiences, but there's love. The blessing we're giving them under the chuppah is that this marriage should be able to get to a point where it reaches the highest level of friendship. It's the second level of friendship or the third level of friendship that we're giving them the bracha under the chuppah. We're not giving them the bracha that they should just like to share experiences. That's everybody on the street and there you show love. Here they're, they're holding by love. You know, love's not enough. You need to grow. How do you grow? Each one lets each one other show who they are. They can complement each other. They can help each other. They can help each other grow. They'll be They'll critique in a loving way and push each other in the right direction. That's what you're hoping for. That's where you want to get to. That's the unbelievable state. That's, that level of reus, that's the highest level that we can... It's even higher than love. That's where we want to go to. So there's no contradiction between the bracha and the pasuk. The pasuk is talking about the lower level of friendship. The bracha is talking about the higher level of friendship. But I think that already sets for us an understanding how Chazal, how the Torah views marriage. So now what the morale is saying, it's we're two halves of a human being. Right? What does that mean? Like there's the Medrash, Hashem takes a soul and divides it into two, puts one in the man, one in the woman, and see how the Shmaya, they'll find each other, and then they will come together as one. But that's I think that's not completely why they're considered to be like a new being. What makes it into a new being is it's a transformative experience. That the commitment of marriage is not just I want to share experiences. Or, unfortunately, in some cases, it's, you know, uh, you, have, when you have businesses that, that come together. There's two ways that you can have. You can have a host, hostile takeover or you can have a merger, you know. Fortunately, many marriages become hostile takeovers, you know, the question of who's, who's in control. It's not, it has to be a dynamic, uh, evolving, transformative experience. That's what it should be. And that's the growth that we're looking for in the marriage. Now, that's the Bria Chadosha. That's becoming a new person. I think that the insight that we which take from it is I think, incredible insight. And as you go back to the Rambam, a Baal Teshuvah, right? on Yom Kippur, we become Bali Teshuvah, the slate is clean. Right? It's very interesting, is that 
We've done a slew of things we've done incorrectly. Who says we're not going to do them again? And in most cases, we do do them again. So how we balay teshuva? Because the chesed, the kindness of Hashem at giving us this mitzvah of teshuva is that the commitment alone is transformative. On Yom Kippur, when we make that commitment, even though we haven't even had the challenge to see if we can withstand it or not, the commitment to make that challenge is a transformative commitment. And if we fall, we fall, and we go back to to the drawing board, we try again. But the commitment that we see from Yom Kippur, that we become a new brio, we become a new person in Yom Kippur, that commitment. So I was thinking that that must be the shot over here too. You know? Shot Esav. Esav. Oh, he's mochal all his Averis, and you know, he's Esav. We're going to forgive him for all his Averis? Why? What is Esav doing that he deserves to have all his Averis, the slate being cleaned? So there's, in last week's parsha, when Avram wants to get a wife for Yitzchak, he asks his servant Eliezer also to go to Padan Aram. He says, I don't want a wife from here. I want a wife from there. Now Eliezer, who is Avram's trusted servant, Avram gives him over the reins of his household, He has a daughter, and he wants his daughter for Yitzchak. So Eliezer says, well, if I go there and there's no one there, can I come back here? He says, no. And Avram understands, and Avram says to him the following. He says, you are an Evid. You come from Canaan. He says that, unfortunately, the way it is, the Canaanim have been cursed. Who cursed the Canaanim? Noach. Noach cursed Canaan when Ham did what he did to him in the tent. So he said, Ein Oror, someone who is cursed, is Ein Amizdabek, cannot cleave to someone that is Baruch, that is blessed. Shame is blessed. Canaan is cursed. You cannot have that successful marriage that we need in a marriage for my son from someone that's coming from Canaan that is cursed because ain't baruch nistabek, aron nistabek baruch. It won't. It won't work. It can't work. I can't take a girl from here. Which Yitzchak understands that. That's why he sends Yaakov, also to Padan Aram. You can't take a girl from here. Esav's first two wives, Chivi and Chiti, they're Canaanim. You can't have a successful transformation of a marriage when it's Baruch. Esav is Baruch too. Esav comes from Avram. Esav comes from Shem. The first two marriages could not be that transformative impact of what a marriage needs to be to cre- create that new formation of a, a unit that can give mechila. For both the man and the woman, by the way, they become a new instead of one and one, you have like a three. You have, you have a, th- it's a third entity here. Can't be with those two. Now, what does Esav see? He says, Vayar Esav ki ra'uz benoz kna'an. Esav sees that his parents look at, this is not good for me, the first two. I want to do the right thing. It means even Esav, as wicked as he is, he's taking the third wife. His commitment is for the right thing. I want someone from shame because I understand I'm not going to get what I need to get from the first two. What happens subsequently, we don't know. But we know that his commitment to marry that third wife was because he understood the first two are not going to have the right impact on him. I want to take that third one. That third one is machlas. And from here we learn that even Esau, the commitment to want to get married to somebody, even the commitment alone, you can get mechila. 
Same way as we said on Yom Kippur, the commitment to do the right thing, that's what we're learning from Asaph. The commitment to, he has that commitment, that's why he's the third wife. He can only come out with a third wife. Because that's the one he understands, is the right, that's the one that he can cleave with, that he can join and grow. That is what, that process, the dynamic process of what marriage, striving to that level of friendship, where we're going to grow from one another, complement one another, supplement each other's deficiencies, help us grow in the areas that we need to grow, that commitment alone is enough for a person to get that mechila on the day of marriage. And that's what we're learning here from, from Esau. I think that's a, a very, very powerful message because I think, A, it shows us what we should be looking into going into marriage, number one. And number two, it doesn't stop there. Because it's just the commitment to do it. We have to follow through and keep working on it. It doesn't just stop. We have to follow through. And that's the, the, the dynamic process of marriage. What happens, unfortunately, you get married and everyone gets busy in what they need to be doing. And it just, it almost, it, it, it devolves to becoming a shared experience. We don't take the time to think, okay, how am I going to grow? How are we going to grow? What's the next level? What can we work together on? How can we supplement each other? What can we do to grow? And I think there's two very important messages here. One, for marriage to have its effect, we have to focus on the growth, how we keep growing to the next level as husband and wife. As husband and wife, what are we doing together? How are we helping each other get to that next level? But I think an even greater impact is we keep looking at our children and we keep saying is, I want my children to grow. You know, I want my children to daven better. I want my children to learn better. I want them to be better human beings. I want them to be more compassionate. I want them to be, you know. We keep looking for growth in our children. But I think the message is that'll happen Imagine if our children look to us every day and see us striving to grow. If our children see us as husband and wife striving to grow and striving to better ourselves. And as I say, most of us, that's it. You know, we get married, done. That's the level we've reached. Because, again, we, we have a thousand and one excuses. Working for, to get a living, raising children, uh, dealing with all the difficulties of life, we've, we lose that introspection. We lose the sense that the purpose is to grow. I've now found my Bas Zug. I found the person that can help me grow. Man for the woman, woman for the man. But we don't, most of us, we stop growing. It goes, it devolves to that lower level of friendship. Maybe it stays love, Sometimes just friendship, sometimes even worse, unfortunately. But that level to grow and, and that process to continue to aspire, to get to the, the most out of what the, the, the transformative union, right? the commitment to it is not enough. It's the fulfillment of that. We have to continue transforming and it's dynamic and keep reaching new heights. And I think showing that to our children is much more impactful than trying to tell them we want them to grow. It's easier said than done, but I think it starts with us. It starts with us. How many of us have even had that discussion? What are we going to do to get to the next level? What do we need to do? Now, I'm not only talking about in mitzvos. I'm talking about in all areas. Empathy compassion, different sensitivities that maybe one party has, the other one doesn't, and working together to strive for that. Controlling anger. It could be so many different things that we can work together to grow, but having that as a goal for us as husband and wife, as the, the whole family unit will be impacted, and please God, it'll be transformational, not just for ourselves, but our children as well. Thank you. Thank you.